First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Elizabeth Holmes wanted to be the new Steve Jobs. She even dressed like him, for goodness sake. And for a while, she fooled everyone, becoming the youngest self-made female billionaire in the world. Forbes even valued her at over four and a half billion dollars. But her miracle blood testing invention was a big con. She's now worth practically nothing and is awaiting trial. Well, her story is literally the stuff of movies. A new one's just been released at the Sundance Film Festival in Utah. But you can't see that one yet. So we've made our own mini movie on the rise and fall of Elizabeth Holmes. This is a revolutionary company that threatens to change healthcare the same way that Amazon changed retail, or Intel and Microsoft changed computing, or Apple, yes, changed the cell phone. The right to protect the health and well-being of every person is a basic human right. A healthcare pioneer is being compared to visionaries like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Elizabeth Holmes, she's the founder and CEO of Theranos, a revolutionary diagnostics company. Her mission is to allow blood testing in every drugstore at a fraction of Medicare costs. The company says it can run up to 40 different tests on a tiny sample of blood. Upending the existing paradigm that's costly, inefficient, and painful for the client, namely you. Her innovation has fueled anticipation in the healthcare industry. She has become wildly popular among those of us who follow things like this. She is the youngest self-made female billionaire in the world. Whenever there is a quote-unquote glass ceiling, there's an iron woman right behind it. You founded this company 12 years ago, right? Tell them how old you were. I was 19. <laughs> People are gonna challenge you, they're gonna fight you, they're gonna try to destroy you, they're gonna do all this stuff. When you love it so much, you wanna keep fighting for it. A federal inspection report finds health startup Theranos ran blood tests during a six-month period despite erratic quality control results. That's where the story of Theranos starts to crumble. It never worked, and there was a series and series and series of deceptive actions that were taking place. All these people had invested, like Betsy DeVos, I think it was, and this company. It was, it was bullshit. And almost every media outlet, including us here at CBS, bought into the Theranos myth. Even when the article started coming out, people kind of didn't want to believe they had George Schultz on the board. How could this Connors convince so many brilliant people? Forbes magazine has downgraded the net worth of Elizabeth Holmes from $4.5 billion to nothing. A high-flying CEO now facing prison time, accused of masterminding a billion-dollar fraud. Elizabeth Holmes has fallen into FBI's hands tonight. This feels like the end of this story for a company that I think a lot of people you know, once thought was going to change medicine. Well, who said business had to be boring? Got a great panel for you. Joining me now is Hirsch Schifrin, an economics professor at Santa Clara University in San Francisco. He specializes in understanding the psychology which drives human behavior when making financial decisions. Vinu Varghis is a criminal defense attorney and former state prosecutor. He joins us from New York. And finally, we have Joseph Fuiz, who is also an inventor in the healthcare industry and was also a neighbor of Elizabeth Holmes. Um, Joseph, you, your, you and your family had a very rough time uh, with Elizabeth Holmes, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But first, I want you to just explain to our viewers very succinctly why this was such a big scandal. First and foremost, I, I, the, the, I think patients are at the center, right? So Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes uh, rolled out a, essentially faulty blood testing technology and used it on kids and cancer patients and all sorts of people. That's, that's maybe the most important on the human side. Um, but in the process of doing so, she also sullied the names of some of the, the, the biggest luminaries in American political and economic life uh, in this $800 million scandal. So she promised an absolute miracle. You could take a little drop of blood and conduct over 200 tests on it. Turned out to be a false claim. Uh, there must be millions of people around the world who may be afraid of needles or have other problems who are incredibly disappointed by this. You know, yes, uh, up to a point. I would tell you, I mean, there are some of the, the, the basic questions of Theranos were never really tested. Uh, there are, uh, the fingertip has more nerve endings than any part of the body, save one. Uh, so it's not entirely clear people would, really would have liked to have used the system. I, I think that the media was, was quick to jump on the bandwagon. 
but I think there were there were there were a number of questions um, uh, that 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 were unanswered. Now she was your father's neighbour for a while, and she sued him over a patent. She said he he infringed one of her patents. What did that case, her conduct during that case, tell you about her? Uh, yeah, so she sued my dad and myself uh, and my other brother um, using uh, David Boyce, as, as, who is the most celebrated litigator in the United States. It was a um, it was a case that that presaged a lot of the um, uh, intimidation and, and political power that was as yet unknown about Theranos. Theranos, when, when that suit was launched, was a relatively quiet company, uh, and frankly, we had no idea what was coming. Uh, when the case started, but a lot of these themes of secrecy uh, and, and sort of bullying uh, were were present in that case. Joseph, one of the whistleblowers, the, the the first mover, if you like, in the the finishing of this empire, the Theranos empire, the whistleblower came to your family for advice, and you put him in touch. Is that right? With John Carreyrou, who wrote this book, uh, Bad Blood. Uh, which led to the demise of the, the entire Theranos uh, empire. Yeah, that's right. So, so the gentleman is identified by the pseudonym Alan Beam in the book Bad Blood. He was a, a medical doctor who was in the process of resigning from Theranos for ethical reasons, essentially because the system didn't work. Uh, and he was, uh, he was very afraid of being sued by, by Theranos, much as we were and uh, reached out as a kind of fellow traveler. And, and out of a series of conversations with him, we were ultimately able to connect him with John Carreyrou, which, uh, which proved, to, proved to be the beginning of the undoing of Theranos. And, and in this way, your family mm -hmm. had its revenge. Uh, yes, I, it, it certainly, you know, certainly the, the exposure of Theranos, uh, it was very vindicating and, uh, and, and, uh, and gratifying. Uh, in, in that it's come to light. You know, it wasn't just investors who felt duped. Employees also felt ripped off. Writing on the anonymous internet forum, one wrote, you not only conned your investors, you conned us too. You had us believing in your mission and trusting your iron fist rule. Another said, from day one, an unnerving feeling. I joined a cult like an observer, not yet brainwashed, that only escalated in sinister intensity until my last day. Let's go to Hirsch, an expert in uh, the psychology that drives financial decisions. It's really interesting, that term, a cult. Is that how you observe it? Yes, I think that that's, uh, that's actually fair. Um, it's uh, in a weaker form, we would say that uh, Theranos exhibited um, groupthink in a very strong measure, which is the tendency to rally around psychologically around your leader in order to impress your leader, gain favor with your leader, support your leader. And uh, when you do that unquestioningly, it does become cult-like behavior. Hirsch, thank you for that. Well, she not only disappointed millions of ordinary people who believed her promises of an affordable and easy blood test, but she also duped her investors. And that's an interesting aspect of this story. How did a young woman with no track record convince rich and experienced people like Rupert Murdoch to part with millions? Elizabeth Holmes gave a masterclass in networking, which would have put LinkedIn to shame. Dropping out of Stanford at 19, her first step was to use her illustrious family's connections. Her first big backer was former neighbor and venture capitalist Tim Draper, who invested a million dollars. A friend of her dad's introduced her to another venture capitalist, Don Lucas, who hooked her up with Oracle founder Larry Ellison. Big break there, he put in a hundred million dollars, and with his seal of approval, all the doors were open. Holmes was granted a meeting with former Secretary of State George Shultz, who joined her board. And he opened the door to other conservative elder statesmen, including another former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. Momentum built, and at the height of the Theranos hype, General James Mattis and former Navy Admiral Gary Ruffhead climbed on board. So too did successful businessmen, including the former CEO of Wells Fargo. 
As she built an illustrious board, she continued to draw in big investors. The Walton family, founders of Walmart, put up $150 million. Media mogul Rupert Murdoch stumped up $125 million. The DeVos family, as in Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, sunk $100 million into the Theranos vision. All in all, investors, some of the most successful, accomplished and richest people around, parted with about $900 million, leaving them wondering, what just happened? Let's go to New York, bring in Vinu Varghese. Uh, Vinu, <laughs> she's facing a number of counts of wire fraud. It sounds like a very archaic, Morning. antiquated kind of phrase. What does that mean? It just means that the, the, perp the fraud here in this case, the, the, com the communications to investors were carried over the wires of the United States, or particularly in this case, monetary transactions. So she convinced investors to wire her money, send money through the wires, through the banks, and, and that constitutes wire fraud you know, in that case where the basis for the wire was a fraud. And this is what the federal prosecutors out in California have, have made a determination and brought a case against her and Ramesh Belwani. Sonny Belwani. Vinu, so this is a, a federal crime, and she's already had to settle with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the financial regulator. What does that settlement tell you about this case right. going forward, and what would you advise her if you were her defense attorney? Well, the fact that the SEC had, had already uh, settled with her, or there was a settlement where she had to pay a fine of $500,000 and take a ban of 10 years before she could serve as a director or officer of any company is a very strong statement. One of the things that occurred during the SEC process, which would not occur during a normal criminal process, is that there were depositions taken. So there's actual videotaped depositions of her. And some of these have been played on, on shows here in the United States at Nightline. This has been released to the public. And in those depositions, she's saying things that show that under oath she's saying things that I don't know. Over two days of depositions, she and, and Sonny Balwani said, I don't know 600 times. For example, to questions like whether um, these, this te the technology was used in, in the military battlefield, in medevacs, these were things that were told to sec former Secretary of State George Schultz. George Schultz used that and tried to convince his own grandson not to be a whistleblower on this case. Hmm. So going forward, you have those statements under oath where she's saying she doesn't know, but those are very dangerous statements for her because it seems that the exact opposite was said by her to other people. Now, she didn't say that if, under oath. She used to give TED Talks. She was interviewed by Bill Clinton for the Clinton Foundation publicly. If she is found guilty, what is uh, the worst case scenario for her? And, and what is your research told you about when this trial might start? The trial's probably not going to get started. I mean, the, the, the case was brought, you know, relatively recently. It's a young case, just brought a, a couple months ago. So the trial won't be actual start for several months because there's a whole discovery process. And in, in this case, that is going to be a lot. The fact that the SEC has already done some of this stuff, they will share their results with the federal prosecutors. But the defense is going to have motions. And their argument is that this was a business that went bad, but not a fraud. Um, the attorney for Balwani actually gave an interview to 2020, and that's exactly what he said. And if she's found guilty, what is she looking at? She's looking at up to 20 years in prison. Um, so under the United States, uh, what are called federal sentencing guidelines, there's going to be, like a, a, basically it's a numbers game. So they'll look at it, the amount of fraud, um, you know, you're talking, I and mean, some, some of the estimations were that it was $700 million uh, that, she, that she got invested. In essence, the, the fraud, because it's on a scale, if you're looking at that number, she could face the entire 20 years. These are recommendations that are made to a judge, and that recommendation is likely going to be actually in excess of 20 years, so she'll be capped at 20 years. Joseph, just want to come back for you for a moment. Um, she, step by step, uh, fr went from her family, which is a pretty well-known, illustrious, well-connected family. Step by step, she made her way to Larry Ellison. This was the big watershed moment for her. Larry Ellison, 
founder of Oracle, gives her $100 million. And from then on, it's pretty easy. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And I, I think in the whole Theranos saga, I, I think this is, this is her, her great genius, is, is her successful networking from, from uh, uh, increasing up, going up the rungs of power and finance in the U.S. It's remarkable networking for a young woman. Let's go back to Hirsch now, an expert in the psychology that drives investments. Uh, this must be a textbook case for you, Hirsch. We've got rich, successful people, accomplished people, going in after Ellison. In fact, you could put Ellison in that group, putting money into something they didn't really understand. Right. Um, this goes on <laughs> more often than, than we would like to think. But in, in this particular case, uh, what makes it so interesting is that you had a very attractive person with a very attractive story, a story that we would want to believe, a story that involved social good, a story that involved the potential for, for, for great wealth increase, and uh, it was quite seducing. So uh, what venture capital as a, as a community works a lot on trust, where venture capitalists trust each other. If one finds a good investment, they often bring in others. And once you have rapport established between investors, they tend to rely more on the feelings generated by, uh, by other investors as much as the facts, how they think and how they feel work together. So getting generate, generating positive emotion is really important, and Elizabeth Holmes knew how to do that. That is really amazing because us ordinary mortals who do not have hundreds of millions of dollars, we think that they can't put a foot wrong. They're going to get a team of, of lawyers, a team of scientists to check this out and report back to them. But actually, they went with a bit of groupthink, herd mentality. Very strong. And, and one, of the, one of the biggest weaknesses in the Theranos board was that it included no scientists. And I think that was by, by design. My guess would be it would be by design on Elizabeth Holmes's part in, in order that there would be no questioning of what it was that, uh, that, that, she, that, she, that she was doing. Thank you, Hirsch. Well, maybe. This was Elizabeth Holmes's destiny, considering her illustrious family history. Here's her father, Christian Rasmus Holmes IV. He was writing about their ancestors, the Fleischmanns, and he said, um, I have personally known members of four generations of Fleischmanns, and I find them on balance to be creative, artistic, eccentric, funny, driven, and restless. They tend to do very interesting things. Uh, let's go back to Joseph now, the former neighbor for a while. Um, Joseph, do you think that she had this sense that her family was great once, and she was going to restore the family name. Yeah, no, there's there's no doubt in my mind that that a lot that the grandiosity of her project and, and the extraordinary breadth of, of of her ambition for such a young woman was was grounded in the idea of restoring the the grandeur and greatness of of the Fleischmann and Holmes family. Was she ever an inventor, Joseph? Uh, she has a lot of patents to her name. Was she ever a gifted? inventor or again was that just an invention in the very narrow legal sense of having letters patent from the u.s government yes uh, but I, i'd like to think being in, an, in, a true inventor involves involves quite a bit more in terms of, of actually solving a challenge with, with some scientific integrity so oh. to balance my answer would be no let me go back to hirsch for a moment now um, hirsch we know that she set herself up in uh <laughs> silicon valley she was pretty much straight across the road from Stanford. What is it about Silicon Valley that gets people believing in your project when they otherwise might not? Uh, I, I, I think there's a, an atmosphere of can-do in Silicon Valley. Very smart people taking very big risks that often pay off. And it's uh, a culture where people have very high ambition and it's a, a very strong drive for success. Oh, you know, Hirsch, um, it's not just her family she looks up to. She also modeled herself on the king of Silicon Valley, Steve Jobs. I mean, she copied his signature turtleneck look. She often referred to the Theranos tech as the iPod of healthcare. And they both rode around in black cars without license plates. Uh, Steve Jobs did it first, of course. Uh, Hirsch, what does this tell us about her? 
There's a psychological principle, it's called representativeness. What it means is that people over rely on stereotypes. So that is a, a weakness that many of us have for making decisions. And I think what she did was she capitalized on it by making herself into as close an image as she could to the icon of what a successful Silicon Valley entrepreneur is like. Vinny, let's uh, come back to you for a second. An amusing observation from you, perhaps? Well, I think one of the other things that should be brought up here, and this is actually more the seedier side of, of, of the relationships that Hirsch was talking about, is that she and her co-defendant were sleeping together. Mr. Uh, Sonny Belwani is an older gentleman, at least 20 years older, and he loaned her money. So when Hirsch is talking about an attractive person, an attractive woman who, who was there and it was a great story, he clearly bought into that. He gave her $20 million, ended up sleeping with her. He had a license plate that said Vini Vini Vici. You know, I came, I saw, I conquered. That's what he did. And now he may end up going to jail uh, with her. Vinny, I was wondering if it was going to be amusing. I'm amused. Elizabeth Holmes, well, she conned a lot of people out of a lot of money. In fact, she's one of the great con artists of all time. But she has some pretty stiff competition. Here's some of our favorites. Business can be a dirty game, and if you don't want to become one of the headlines, watch out. Learn a lesson from our Rolodex of Hell. Here's our top five fraud stars. In at five, Turkey's Mehmet Aydın. The crafty 26-year-old created an online game, Farm Bank, loosely based on Farmville. Players bought into a real farm, except it was an even more real Ponzi scheme. Aydin fled the country, taking $129 million with him. At four, Nigeria's Emmanuel Unwuda. Airport, anyone? Impersonating Nigeria's central bank governor, he convinced a Brazilian bank to invest $242 million in his new airport. Except their investment didn't take off. Because the airport didn't even exist. In at three, the Philippines' Michael de Guzman and the biggest gold fraud ever. We got a gold mine. We got a gold mine. We got a gold mine! Yeah! The lead geologist for Briex Minerals persuaded investors they'd found 70 million ounces in Indonesia. Briex went from the brink of bankruptcy to being worth four and a half billion dollars. But when investors started to sniff around, Guzman cracked and killed himself and the truth soon came out. In at number two, Italy's Aldo Bonasoli and Belgium's Count Alain de Villega. During the oil crisis, the electrician and nobleman, an odd duo, convinced the world that their invention could find black gold using gravitational waves. France's oil giant Elf invested $150 million, but the technology turned out to be as mythical as the Elf. And when the fraud was revealed, the French government was so embarrassed that they covered up the whole affair. And finally, top of the list, the veteran, silver-haired socialite and trusted Manhattan investor, Bernie Madoff. He defrauded his investors, including Steven Spielberg, Kevin Bacon and John Malkovich, of around $65 billion. I made so many mistakes. Those warm, smiling eyes hiding the biggest Ponzi scheme of all time. Arrested in 2008, the octogenarian is now serving a 150-year sentence. See you in 2158, Bernie. You see, crime doesn't pay. Well, not always, anyway. Do you think you're immune from being ripped off? Let's find out from our expert. Hirsch, first of all, what makes people think they can get away with it and why do people, when they, they smell something's wrong, they know it's too good to be true, why do they get into the investment anyway? Well, great self-confidence is why people think that they can get away with it. And the reason that people tend to fall for it is that once you've been persuaded by a very skilled, I will say, actor, uh, who will spin a fairy tale you want to believe, there is a very strong tendency not to look for what doesn't fit, what doesn't look for disconfir mm. disconfirming information. We tend to want to look for things that fit. We tend to want to ignore things that don't. And that very strong human tendency makes us vulnerable to being conned by an effective con artist. So your advice is, 
if you smell something wrong, don't ignore it. Don't ignore it and ask yourself, if this turns out not to be true, what would I have missed? Let me look now before it's too late. Uh, okay, you get the last word there, Hirsch. Great advice for uh, us all, the panel, and you at home. <laughs> Vinu Vagis, thank you also for your contribution to the Nexus. And uh, Joseph, thank you so much as well for well, you're telling us about your personal experience uh, with Elizabeth Holmes. Well, as we mentioned, the documentary about all of this is premiering at the Sundance Film Festival in Utah right now. And it doesn't stop there. Hollywood has its hands on this story too, as you'd expect. Jennifer Lawrence will play Elizabeth Holmes. She has the look down, but can she master that unique voice that she's uh, put on? Who knows? But that is all we have time for this week. Remember, you can see this and all our other episodes on our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. Till next week, goodbye. <laughs>